sums and direct sums. of vector spaces. We're going to begin, as usual, by letting v be a vector space. And I'll remind you, for the last time or so, what the actions are. Not fully qualified, or not fully quantified, but just something to jog your memory. We want addition in this space to be defined and commutative, to be associative. We want an identity, and we want an inverse, an additive inverse. Those uh, in this column are the additive abelian group axioms. And over here, I'm going to put the, the ones that describe the field action. This one we also call an associative property. And that's that it doesn't matter if I multiply first in the field and then apply the action or multiply or apply the action twice. It also has an identity requirement that 1 times v is equal to v. And it has two distributive requirements. A times u plus v equals a u plus a v. And a plus b v equals a v plus b v. So let v be a vector space. And we're going to look at two subspaces of V, or some number of subspaces of V. So let U and U prime be subspaces. And remember that to be a subspace of a vector space, we're talking about a subset, which is also a vector space. And we have a criterion for that. We check that 0 is in the subspace, the candidate for being a subspace, that the subspace is closed under scalar multiplication. So u v and u implies u plus v and u. And we check that it's closed under scalar multiplication. So under addition and under scalar multiplication, if alpha is in f and u is in u, then it must be that alpha u is in u. So we could check, do all the properties, check that it's a vector space, or we could just check this criterion. So these are two subspaces of V that satisfy this criterion. We sometimes call, we're talking about multiple subspaces, we sometimes call this, this big space V the ambient space, because it sits all around the other, all around the other spaces, the smaller things. And the idea is that given V and these two subspaces, we can define something which you could call a sum of u and u prime. And we we'll can denote that by u plus u prime. And we're going to define that as, the set, as set wise first. It's the set of elements little u plus little u prime, such that little u is in big U, and little u prime is in big U prime. Now the addition here has to be defined <coughs> in the ambient vector space V, because these two things lie in different subspaces. So this is not the addition inside these subspaces. But of course, all the additions are in some sense the same addition, because the subspaces have to inherit the scalar multiplication and the addition of the ambient vector space, the larger subspace. The larger space which they are subspaces. Uh, so let's prove a claim. Since u and u prime are subspaces, so is their sum, u plus u prime. And so how do we check that? We know over here, we can check all the axioms that it is, in fact, a vector space, or we can just check this criterion. So let's go through the criterion. So first of all, we want to find that, check that 0, the 0 of the vector space, is in <coughs> u plus u prime. We know that it's in u, because u is a subspace, and that was a part of the criterion to be a subspace. And we know that 
the zero of the vector space is in the other subspace u prime. So by definition of u plus u prime, zero plus zero is in u plus u prime. And by the additive identity axiom of the vector space v, or either u or u prime, this is equal to zero in the vector space. So we've just showed that zero, the zero vector is in u plus u prime. Secondly, we want to check closure under addition. So u, v, in u, we have to pick two elements in each space, u, uh, u prime and v prime. Let those be in u prime. We make those assumptions. Then, of course, <coughs> little u plus little u prime is an element of big u plus u prime by definition, and also little v plus little v prime is an element of u plus u prime because this is something plus something which is in u and something which is in u prime, something which is in u and something which is in u prime. Okay. <clears throat> and what we want to show is that these two elements of u plus u prime, if I add them together, u plus u prime plus v plus v prime, that thing has to be also in u plus u prime. Okay? And to be in u plus u prime, so far this is our only definition or criterion for that. So we have to, just, we have to show that this can be written in this form. Something in u plus something in u prime. So how do we do that? Yes. Yeah. We rearrange them so that's really two elements. Exactly. We rearrange them. So, and to rearrange them means we're using commutativity and associativity to move around the vectors and move around the parentheses in this ambient vector space. This thing star is equal to a rearranged version of that sum u plus v plus u prime plus v prime. And here we have now something which is in u and something which is in u prime. So we've shown that it's closed under addition. We've written this sum of these elements as something of that form. So we can do something similar for <coughs> scalar multiplication the last of our subspace criteria. If I, if I let alpha be a field element, alpha times u plus u prime. So this is an arbitrary element of u of big U plus big U prime. By what property? I can write it like this. Distributive. Distributive, distributive property in V. Because these two, these two things are in different subspaces. So this is by distributive in V. And then by closure, scale, closure under scalar multiplication in U, and closure under scalar multiplication in U prime, this thing is in U, and this thing is in U prime. So I've succeeded in writing alpha times this element as something in U plus something in U prime, therefore it's closed under scalar multiplication. Okay. So we can extend this definition suppose I have some finite number of <coughs> subspaces We can make a similar definition to the one that I'm erasing right now, which just has more than one, more than two u's in it.
that is, we define big U1 plus big U2 up to big Um, at least as a set, as a set of all vectors of the form little u1 plus little u2 up to little um, such that each ui is in its big ui space. Each of these is in its corresponding big ui. And now I want to do a little bit towards justifying our notation of plus. Right? Is there a zero subspace? Is there some subspace for which if I add any other subspace to it, I get back the subspace I started with by this definition? Would be what? Yeah, almost. Except that empty has not a vector space. Closest we can get is the set which contains one element. The one element vector space which just has zero. That's a zero, so it has an additive identity. It's also commutative. So let's prove that it's commutative. So let U and W be subspaces of V. Then by definition, the, subs the subspace U plus W is just as a set elements which can be written to the form little u plus little w with little u and u and little w and w. And of course w plus u is very similar. Little w plus little u such that u is in u and w is in w. And the reason these two sets are equal is because of what axiom? A vector space. Commutativity. That's right. By commutativity of addition in the vector space. Right. These two elements are equal. So these, so these two sets will be equal if I choose the same u and the same w. OK, fair enough. There's still some somewhat intuitive and somewhat non-intuitive behavior. So let's do some examples of subspaces in addition. So let's take our infinite dimensional vector space. Let v be real valued functions on the unit interval. Picture is here's our unit interval. It's just some function. It doesn't have to be continuous, it just has to be a function. And let's define some subspaces. Let u be all the functions in V. This is a subspace we looked at already, such that when I apply this function to one third, at one third, it's always zero. Talked about why that was a subspace a couple of classes ago. And also, let's put another one in there. So we'll require these functions to take the value zero at both one third and one half. And let's make w another subspace uh, where we restrict ourselves to functions f in v such that f of two thirds is equal to zero. And you can show that's also a subspace by checking the subspace criteria. If I choose a number other than zero, it wouldn't be because the zero function wouldn't be in there. But zero is kind of special. OK, so let's figure out what is u plus w. How would you describe that? <coughs> Sorry? <coughs> oh. 
which functions in G can be written as a sum of something in U and something in W. Well, that's one possible answer, right? So suppose we have this thing, functions which f of 1 third equals f of 1 half equals f of 2 thirds. So that's actually not u plus w. That's actually u intersection w. It's the things that have to satisfy all these conditions. u plus w is kind of, you know, we talked in the beginning about how u union w is not a vector space. But we want some sort of the smallest vector space containing it, and that's what u, u plus w is. That's kind of the thing that plays the role of the union. I thought I saw the answer for that. Uh, I was just thinking, is like f of one third w and then f of two thirds like the function of f of one third w? So w is, is the whole set of functions. Every function in v, which has the property that its value of two thirds is equal to zero. So right. it could be. So At the, at the, for the other function, right? So, and exactly. And, if, and, and conversely, f at the, the, the addition, I have a function f that's in u, and I have a function g, which is in w, right? This, when I add these together to a function f plus g, remember that the value of that at x is equal to f of x plus g of x, okay? And the scalar multiplication was defined by, uh, by this. Property alpha f of x equals, um, well, we're defining alpha f over here, alpha f of x, where we're using multiplication in the reals over here, or addition in the reals. And so in particular, though f of 2 thirds is constrained to be 0, g of 2 thirds in the other space, um, uh, well, sorry, I said the other way around. If g, is, g of 2 thirds is constrained to be 0, but f of 2 thirds could be anything, and conversely for 1 third and 1 half, and so what we end up getting is that this is any function. Um, so one way to think about it is to say, well, you know, take, take function and take some, tar I have some target function, t, call it. t, and then take the function in w, which is equal to t, except the 2 thirds, where I set it to 0, right? And then just take the function in u, which is the value of t at 2 thirds, at 2 thirds and 0 everywhere else. You add those together, you get back the target function. Okay. So it turns out that here, you know, Adding those two together, I recover the whole, the whole space. I, I should note that it's very redundant, right? So for any, any function from 0, 1 to r, there's many ways of writing it in terms of a sum of these two functions. You know, I could add, I could take, you know, say, f of 1 fourth, I could add 5 to the function here and subtract 5 here, and I'd still get a valid sum. So it's not in any way unique, but it's, it works. OK, so let's make another set. Right. In that case, it would be it would be equal to w because you would be wouldn't be able to get rid of the one third, but you'd be able to get rid of the one half. That's right. So, along those lines, let's let's add another. Um, Subset in, subspace. Let's let this z be the f set f and v such that f of one third and f of two thirds are both equal to zero. And let's say what is w plus z? It's almost the same as the one you set up, you said. We were just discussing this would be the this would be functions which are zero or two thirds because we can't do that trick, right? This one is constrained to be zero or two thirds, and this one is also constrained to be zero or two thirds. So no matter which functions we choose, we'll always get something out which is zero or two thirds. Okay? And you could say that this thing w plus z is a proper subset of of v and a proper subspace. So this symbol means 
a subset and not equal to. So there's sort of three subset related symbols. These both mean subset or equal to, unfortunately. This one means subset or not equal to. So these, this is just, people have different conventions, but they mean the same thing, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Let's do another example. Let's, let's do an example that's a little bit more geometric. <coughs> I can think about vectors and planes in three-dimensional space. Try to visualize each of these things. So let's let V be a vector space, which is isomorphic to R3. Later on, we'll define exactly what that means, but you should just think about it as a copy of R3, OK? So R3, and I'm thinking about this vector space as being as a set, vectors x, y, and z, such that x, y, and z are all real numbers. That's real three-dimensional space that, that we live in. And the, the definition of addition and multiplication is as we discussed. So I have x, a vector v and a vector v prime, which is x prime, y prime, z prime. I add them coordinate-wise, x plus x prime, y plus y prime, z plus z prime. And scalar multiplication, similarly, is done element-wise. And let's define some subsets. So let's let u be the subspace. Um, and you can check that it's a subspace. Right? If I set x equal to 0, 0 is in there. And I can check that it's closed under addition and scalar multiplication. Let's let w be the subspace x, y, 0. Ah, let's change this to y. Sorry. That makes it a little bit cleaner. Um, such that x and y are in R. And let's let z be the subspace 0, 0, z, such that z is in R. So we can draw a picture. Let's, let's pick some axes. This is x, this is y, and z is the one that's coming straight out at you. Like a little. So what does u look like? u goes twice as far in the x direction as it goes in the y direction. So let's do like this. Right, that's u goes off in both directions infinitely. And let's ask what some of these subspaces are. Okay, so how about u plus w? So what is w on this picture? Some x, some y, such that xy is an r, and z is equal to 0. Yeah, so w is just the whole plane here. u is this line. What is u plus w? Okay. Everything. So u plus w is just the whole plane again. Not, you know, we haven't picked up any three dimensions, but it's the whole plane again. So this is, this is totally redundant, and this, this representation of any vector in W is the sum of something in U and something in W is, is not unique. Okay. How about uh, U plus Z? Yeah, so U plus Z. I take U, I add any Z I want, and I get this plane that comes out of the board at U. So it's planted plane that comes out of the board. perpendicular to the board. How about uh, w plus z? That's an easy one. That's everything. Okay, so how about one that's a little bit harder to think about? Let's define a new uh, subspace, z prime. And let's let z get involved with the other variables a little bit. Make it 0, 
z to z. z is in r. And let's figure out what u plus z prime is. So the simplest answer is just to take it literally. We, ha we know we have a rule for addition, and so we can write u plus z prime according to our definition of addition of subspaces as vectors of the form, well, I'm, I have something in u, which is 2x, uh, or let's say y, 2, uh, x is fine. 2x, x, 0. We have something in z, which is of the form 0, z, 2z, and we add them together element-wise. x is in r, and z is in r. Now, what dimension is this space going to be? Is it a line, a plane, point, three-dimensional space? It's going to be two-dimensional. There's only two parameters. It could be at most two-dimensional. If some of these parameters are redundant, it could be lower dimensional. Okay? It sits in three-dimensional space in an interesting way, but it's only two-dimensional. Okay? Um, so how do we think about what this is? So this, first of all, by itself is just is a just fine description of the answer, right? This is the this, this is the sum of these two subspaces. I can make this a little cleaner by getting rid of the plus zeros, which don't do anything. Doing addition in R. We can get rid of the zeros. That should be a Z. Um, but there's sort of, sort of interaction between these that we have to keep track of. So, you know, one way to think about um, a space like that, this is kind of the constructive version. We could also think about it uh, kind of in the opposite way as the solution to some system of equations or some linear equation. Right? So we could try to write down an equation that's satisfied um, by every vector in that space. You want to think of an equation that would be satisfied by that? So how about 1 times this plus 1 times this? That's 2x plus 2z minus 2 times the thing in the middle. 2x minus 2x minus z. That's always 0 for any choice of x, for any choice of z. Right? There are lots of ways of expressing that. One way is to use the concept of a dot product. Right? So we'll have better version of this idea when we talk about inner products later in the class. But a dot product, just I have two vectors, x, y, z, and x prime, y prime, z prime. And their dot product is just the sum x times x prime plus y times y prime plus z times z prime. That's a real number. These are real vectors. These are all real numbers. Okay? That's and you think about that as an efficient way of, of writing an equation like this, right? So if I if I write here 1 minus 2, 1, then I get uh, x times 1 plus 2 times y, or minus 2 times y plus z. Okay? That's kind of the equation we want. If we plug in these entries of this, uh, you know, those into x, I plug 2x into x, I plug x plus z into y, and I plug 2z into z, that's going to be 0. And so this here is also has the interpretation of a vector. And the idea is that it's a vector which is perpendicular or orthogonal to the other vectors. So just as z has nothing in common with x and y, and if I take a, a, z, a vector which is in this subspace z, 0, 0, z, and I take its dot product with any vector here, it's going to be 0 times x, 0 times y, z times 0, so it's going to be 0. The dot product of the vector here and the, any vector in the w plane. So what we're saying here is the dot product of this vector, which is crooked somehow, and any vector in this space u plus z is going to be 0. So to get a picture out of that, we think about another copy of this xy plane. And let's plot this vector on it, xyz plane. The z is coming at you. So we go, say, over by 1. So any multiple of this would work too. right? I can scale this by any number, and it would still be 0. So I go over by 1, I go down by 2, <coughs> and I go out by 1. So there's a vector right here. And the plane, which is perpendicular to that vector, you know, is, is this space. You can draw that as you know, it's kind of slanted up and out of the blackboard. 
And you can also think about it as that you've taken this situation where I have z and I have the blackboard and I just twisted that around until I got to this point. So that's a preview. I mean, we're going to get a little bit more into what's going on here with inner products as we go on. But I wanted to per bring it up as one way to think about this space of solutions. But of course, this is an algebraic answer. It's perfectly, perfectly good. Um, OK. So <clears throat> just as an aside, this, this well, in some sense, linear algebra or su subspaces like this can be thought of as solutions to linear equations like this one, or systems of linear equations. You can also think about something which was a set of all solutions to a system of nonlinear equations or polynomial equations, multivariate polynomial equations, in which case the space would be curved. Um, and that subject is called algebraic geometry. So you may have the opportunity to take something in that at some point in the future. That's kind of where it goes. OK. so. Just like we have in this situation, right? So in this situation, we have a, a problem, and the answer of our problem can be described constructively as everything which can be written in this form. And it can also be described kind of implicitly as everything which satisfies some equation or some property. So many mathematical objects are like that. And even our definitions, like the definition of sum, is one of those examples. So we could also define. U plus or the sum of subspaces in terms of its properties. This is sort of a dual definition, in the same sense this is a dual definition of the space, either constructive or in terms of what it satisfies or what's true about it. So let's think of this as a proposition or an alternate definition. Let u1, u2, um be subspaces. V. Then u1 plus dot 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 plus um is the smallest subspace. V containing U1 up to Um, which is the same as saying it contains the union. Right? U1, U2, up to Um. So this is the sense in which this sum is really the right notion of union for vector spaces. It's the smallest thing, which is still a vector space, um, and it's still a subspace of V, and which contains the, contains the union of these vector spaces. And to see why that's, go why that's true, <laughs> well, first of all, um, each, each subspace is in the sum. And if uh, W is some subspace of V such that U1 is in W, all these U's are in W as a set. Then any U1 plus U2 plus up to Um must be in W, uh, where you know, little ui is in big ui. And why is that? This is because of adequate closure. OK. So that's the idea. So now in, in our examples, especially these examples like you know, we had this space w and we had a space u. And we could write any vector in w as a sum of something w and something in u. 
but you know, I have a lot of redundancy. Uh, or in our example of the f of 2 thirds being 0, in all of those sums, there's a lot of redundancy. So, <coughs> so if, say, w equals u1 plus u2, usually any w in big W has many kind of decompositions. Little w equals u1 plus u2. You know. For example, in this case, you know, I could add something along here, subtract it from the other vector, and it's still a perfectly good answer. So to give a concrete example, Suppose I have three vector spaces, which are subspaces of R2. Let's call them U1, U2, and U3. And I want U1 to be things of the form x, 2x, U2 to be ones of the form um, x, x, and U3 to be those of the form 2x, x. In each of these, there's the set such that x is in R. So put it up there. I look like that. And I take a vector like 1, 1. On the one hand, I can write 1, 1 as a sum of something in each of these spaces, something in U1. Um, this is in U2. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, this is in U. Two, something in U1, and something in U3. And I can also write it in some other way. Minus 2, minus 2, plus 1, 2, plus 2, 1. More than one representation of, of a vector as a, as a sum, of, an element of the sum of those spaces. So to remedy this situation, to find a, a decomposition which is more canonical, find a direct sum. Okay, which I'll do now. And the direct sum is just what happens when we require decomposition in a sum to be unique. <coughs> okay. So, definition. First of all, you know, suppose we have u1 up to um subspaces of a vector space V. Suppose that every element V and V can be written V equals U1 plus Um, little Ui and big Ui. If that's the case, we say that v equals u1 plus u2 plus. Right. We've just given a name to the sum of these subspaces. If every element of v, moreover, if also every element of v can be written uniquely in this form. Mm -hmm. 
we say u e v equals u1 plus blah, 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 plus um. We say that v is the direct sum of these subspaces. u1 dot, 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 up to u m. And the notation for that is v equals u1 circle with a plus inside. Can I pronounce it O plus or direct sum? Um. Yeah. What's the word between ever and O? Element. It's abbreviation for element. Every element of V. So if we force it to be unique, or we require it to be unique, then this, this, this is called a direct sum decomposition. In this situation, if I give you a vector over here, there's only one choice of little u's in each of these things, such that the sum, they can be added together to get v. And you, know, you can think about that this is slightly misleading, because it has also this orthogonality property. You, know, you can think about the situation where we have something like that. right? But, but it's also true if these two ver vectors are not perpendicular. If I have, say, a two-dimensional space, and I just have two vectors, two subspaces, which are not perpendicular to each other, it also gives a direct sum decomposition. Because any vector in here can be written uniquely in, in terms of vectors there. And that's going to lead us to the concept of basis. Okay. Four minutes. Okay, but this doesn't give me any way of telling if something is a direct sum. Right? Unless I have finitely many elements in my vector space, it will be totally impractical, and we have no real method to check whether V has only one decomposition. So just as with subspaces, we're going to use a, we're going to have a criterion, a test or a criterion for, for being a direct sum. Proposition, well, let's call this the direct sum criterion. This is in your book. This is Proposition 1.8. Suppose that u1 up to um are subspaces of a vector space v. Then v is the direct sum of these subspaces if and only if the following, hold. First of all, V has to, well, at least be the sum of these vector spaces. So I have to be able to express every element. That's the part without uniqueness. That's the first part up here. And then we have to have uniqueness. But as it turns out, I only have to check the uniqueness of one vector, the zero vector. <coughs> to write zero as a sum, u1 for some vectors where each ui in big ui is if they are all zero. So each of these UIs has to be zero. So it ends up being OK. You don't have to check every vector. The only vector you have to check is the zero vector itself. And we'll explain why that's true. You can read about it in your book, and we'll explain it next time.